King Nebuchadnezzar is the world's most famous pagan ruler who warred against God. But why did the God of Israel choose the evil, idolatrous King Nebuchadnezzar as his servant with power over all the nations and even the beasts of the field? Nebuchadnezzar, one of God's greatest foes, served the Lord with repentance because God called him my servant three times in the book of Jeremiah. God used Nebuchadnezzar as an instrument of judgment against two groups, the rebellion nations and the apostate kingdom of Judah. Northern Israel went to Assyria, while the southern kingdom, Judah, turned to paganism. Nebuchadnezzar, son of King Nabopolassar, ruled Babylon after his father freed it from Assyria and destroyed Nineveh. He married Syaxara's daughter, uniting the Median and Babylonian dynasties. He became the most powerful Babylonian king, conquering Judah, demolishing Jerusalem, and exiling the Jews to Babylon. The Bible mentions him 88 times in the prophecies of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel in the last chapters of Kings and Chronicles. Jeremiah chapter 27, verses 6 through 7 says, And now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him. And all nations shall serve him, and his son, and his son's son, until the very time of his land come. Judah wasn't the only kingdom under God's judgment. Time ran out for the Phoenician cities of Tyre and Sidon, the Philistines, Moabites, Ammonites, Ammonites, Arabians, Elamites, and Egyptians. God chose Nebuchadnezzar to become his servant to accomplish his goals, as mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 8 through 9. Therefore, this is what the Lord of armies says, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon my servant, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations, and I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and hissing and an everlasting place of ruins. God fulfilled his prophecies by making the nations fall before the Babylonian army. Nebuchadnezzar, his servant, conquered all the nations and ruled the known world. From a human perspective, he was a great king and warrior. But the truth is that he only achieved this by God's will. The prophet Nahum prophesied Nineveh's destruction 100 years before it happened. The city would be flooded, the palace would be put on fire, and the queen would be captured. Their hunting lions were gone. Nineveh's fall was inevitable because they practiced debasement and magic. Secular sources indicated that the Medes and Babylon besieged the city in the Battle of Nineveh in 612 BCE. True to Nahum's prophecy, the Tigris River flooded the city and there was much plundering and burning. Nineveh fell in 612 BC and new powers rose to claim the lands that Assyria had once dominated. Pharaoh Necho, the Egyptian king, led his great army north to Carchemish, an ancient city-state on the Euphrates River in Syria or modern-day southern Turkey. Jeremiah, a prophet, foretold its downfall in Jeremiah chapter 46, verses 1 through 12. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to occupy the territory that the Assyrians had held and fought a great battle in Carchemish that made Pharaoh Necho flee to the Egyptian border. Nebuchadnezzar heard of his father's death and returned to Babylon to become king in 605 BCE. He came to Jerusalem after his campaign near the Egyptian border, where Jehoiakim, the Jewish king, swore allegiance to him. Daniel and the other princes went to Babylon as hostages during this time. Phoenician ships served Tyre, a great trading city on Lebanon's coast. It traded commodities from the known world in its market. The ships of Tarshish brought metals from Britain. Ezekiel 27 lists its many trading partners in his prophecy. Ezekiel 28 portrays Tyre as a wicked city. The king of Tyre, a pagan high priest, was possessed. 300 years earlier, Jezebel, the daughter of the king of Zidon, a sister city of Tyre, had introduced 850 priests of Baal and Ashtaroth to Israel when she married King Ahab. The king of Tyre in Nebuchadnezzar's time was the high priest for these gods. 
and was Satan's vessel, as Ezekiel 28, 11, 19 describes. Ezekiel predicted Tyre's downfall in 586 BCE. Josephus says Nebuchadnezzar besieged Tyre for 13 years from his seventh year of reign. When the Babylonians breached the coastal city's walls, the same year they raised Jerusalem, they found Tyre's treasures moved to another nearby island. Alexander the Great completed the final destruction of Tyre in 332 BC. He scraped the stones of the coastal city into the ocean to build a causeway to the island. As Ezekiel prophesied, Nebuchadnezzar had fulfilled the first part of the prophecy, but he and his army got no spoils from Tyre. God rewarded him with the land and wealth of Egypt for serving his will during the long siege. After his campaign in Tyre, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and its temple in 586 BC. After besieging it for over a year, he had already attacked the city twice in the years 606 and 597 BC. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel predicted this destruction because of Jerusalem's idolatry and wickedness. God used Nebuchadnezzar as his servant to judge Jerusalem. Jeremiah prophesied in Israel and Ezekiel in Babylon with the same message, Nebuchadnezzar would come and destroy Jerusalem for her persistent idolatry and wickedness. The pagan king was God's servant to execute judgment. Judgment on all the nations. Judah was not alone in receiving judgment from God. In Jeremiah chapter 25, we have a list of all the nations that Nebuchadnezzar would destroy. Jeremiah was told to take the wine cup of the fury of the Lord and to cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. Here is the list of nations God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to destroy. For 35 years, Nebuchadnezzar fought wars and built Babylon into a great city by 570 BC. He had executed all his judgments except one, Egypt's judgment. In 606 BCE, he chased Pharaoh Necho to the Egyptian border, but did not invade Egypt. Pharaoh Hophra, the new and formidable ruler, had a powerful army. Nebuchadnezzar's experience with the campaign in Carchemish made him reluctant to invade Egypt. But if he was to be the supreme king of kings, he would need to conquer Egypt. Daniel had interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream as the king being the head of gold, and that wheresoever the children of men dwell God hath made thee ruler over them all. If Daniel's God was the one true God, then God would deliver Egypt to the king. Nebuchadnezzar led his army to Egypt, where Pharaoh Hophra and his general Amasis fought a civil war. He ravaged the land from north to south for 12 months, meeting little resistance from the divided Egyptian forces. God rewarded him with the wages of his army for their service at Tyre. After 12 months, he returned to Babylon as the king of kings worldwide, as Daniel chapter 4 verse 29 says. Daniel 4, 1, 3 documents the testimony of the world's most powerful pagan king, who once set himself against God. He admits that the Most High God rules the kingdom of men. Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all the peoples, nations, and populations of all languages who live in all the earth, may your peace be great. I am pleased to declare the signs and miracles that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his miracles. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. The Babylonian king, who built the world's first great empire, enjoys peace and wealth, but a heavenly messenger cuts down a huge tree in his disturbing dream. Leaving only a metal-bound stump, he calls on Daniel, a Jewish exile, to explain the dream. So I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon, so that they might tell me the interpretation of the dream. Then the soothsayer priests, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners came in. And I related the dream to them, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. Daniel enters the king's court, but Nebuchadnezzar recognizes Daniel as one in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. In other words, the pagan king sensed the spirit of the holy god in Daniel. The king worshipped Belmerodach an idol or a demon impersonating a god. Daniel reveals that the tree represents Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom, 
and that the dream is a warning from God that the king will be humbled for his pride and arrogance. He will be driven away from people and live like an animal for seven years until he acknowledges God's sovereignty over all nations. A year later, Nebuchadnezzar boasts about his achievements and power while refusing to repent as he worshipped Belmerodach. Instead of giving the glory of conquest to God, he praised himself in Daniel 4.29.30. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king began speaking and was saying, Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesties? In verses 31 to 32, a voice from heaven announces the dream's fulfillment. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you, and you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the animals of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. The king loses his sanity, throne, and wanders among the beasts of the field. God struck him with madness because the king rejected God and God's revelation. Other deeds include what he tried to do to Daniel's friends in chapter 2. He heated the furnace seven times hotter than usual when he sentenced them to the fire. In Jeremiah 29, he used fire as capital punishment for two Jewish men. In 2 Kings chapter 25, he took Zedekiah's vision after destroying Jerusalem. But before he did that, he showed no mercy to Zedekiah's two sons in front of him, so that in his blindness, this act was the last thing he saw. In 2 Kings 24, Nebuchadnezzar imprisoned the 18-year-old Jewish king, Jehoiakim, for 36 years. At the end of the seven years of living, crawling, and eating like an animal, Nebuchadnezzar regains his reason and praises God for his justice and mercy. He is restored to his kingdom and honors God as the true king of heaven. Daniel chapter 4 verses 34 to 36 speaks of the king's salvation. Was the pagan ruler saved? Many Christian scholars think so. Whatever the case, the story of King Nebuchadnezzar is an example of God's sovereignty over all men and the truth that the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will.